So climate activists can be quite inventive with the kinds of action they undertake, as well as organizing protests. We've seen them glue themselves to highways, throw orange powder on snooker tables, cover Rishi Sunak's house in black cloth, uh, black cloth and, even, and even smear cake on a Picasso. Now, these tactics are all forms of civil disobedience, which is a form of nonviolent law breaking that roughly has the following rationale behind it. First, do something to communicate the injustice and urgency of the climate crisis to as many people as possible. Second, convince a large enough proportion of the population of the moral urgency of doing something about this injustice. And then leverage government's need for popular support to affect policy change. Now, in theory, the logic of nonviolent civil, civil disobedience is compelling, and we can see why most climate groups in the global north, at least, are ideologically committed to it. This method communicates an injustice, changes the hearts and minds of the people, and then leverages governments to affect change. And it does it all peacefully. In fact, nonviolent civil disobedience seems to have an illustrious history of success from the civil rights movement in the US to the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. So if nonviolent civil disobedience can work to bring about these other massive social changes, then surely it can be an effective means of combating climate injustice. Now, I, I think, however, we have good reason to doubt that it can. First, these tactics of nonviolent civil disobedience rely on shifting the weight of public opinion. This process might not be quick enough to meet the extreme time pressure of the climate crisis. Second, we've recently seen a growing frustration with and alienation from the actions of some climate groups. When Insulate Britain blocked roads, or when XR glued themselves to tube trains, or when Just Stop Oil disrupted sports events, for example, the people they inconvenienced felt unfairly treated. I'm not the perpetrator of climate change, they said, so why should I be inconvenienced? Why are these activists targeting me? Now, this feeling of unfairness angers people and pushes them away from the climate movement. Now, of course, the activist might reply that the purpose of these disruptive but nonviolent actions is not to target ordinary people, but is instead to highlight the fact that the long tendrils of the fossil fuel industry are everywhere and that normal life as we know it will be severely disrupted by climate change, far more so than a person blocking a road. But this message seems to get lost. If civil, if civil disobedience is meant to communicate an injustice, then it seems that the communication hasn't been very good. And if the aim of this communication is to get as many people on side as possible, then it's not clear that this is the right way to do it. Most importantly, though, I think that the most serious doubts we can have about the efficacy of nonviolent civil disobedience come from looking at the history of social change. In his 2021 book, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, which you'll find on the reading list at the bottom of the handouts, I hope everyone's managed to get them there, um, Andreas Malm argues that many of the major social changes of the last century, like first wave feminism, the anti-apartheid struggle and the civil rights movement, succeeded only because the nonviolent tactics of mass scale popular movements were supported by more radical sub movements, which employed or at least credibly threatened violence. The suffragettes engaged in concerted campaigns of window smashing. The civil rights movement had the Black Panthers and other guerrilla groups. And even Nelson Mandela encouraged the targeting of key military and civilian infrastructure towards the end of the anti-apartheid struggle. So Malm takes these examples to show that the kind of radical policy changes we need to avert climate disaster can only be brought about by the combination of nonviolent civil disobedience with more violent direct action like the targeted destruction of property. So I ask you, is it time to expand our activist imagination even further and think beyond nonviolent civil disobedience to more direct action? Would such action really help the climate movement? And even if it did, could it ever be morally permissible? So these then are the questions that I want us to think about in this session. The plan for which is, is as follows. First, I'll narrow the scope of our discussion to violence against property rather than people. Then I'll ask whether acts of violence against property can be an effective activist tool and argue that in theory, at least they can be. Finally, I'll move beyond the efficacy question and ask whether such acts can be morally justified. And to finish, I'll argue that in one important way, I think they can be.
So before starting on all of that, it's important to note that when I talk about direct action or uncivil disobedience, I'm talking primarily about economic sabotage or the targeted destruction of property. So in the climate context, we can call the sabotage of property for environmental purposes ecotage. So e ecotage could take many forms. It could be anything from popping the tires of SUVs to destroying mining equipment to blowing up a pipeline. But what all acts of ecotage have in common, however, is that they all aim at the destruction of property rather than any kind of violence against people. So why do I want to focus on this kind of direct action? Why do I want us to focus on ecotage? Well, most of all, because there's been an uptick uh, in ecotage's public profile recently, largely due to the publication of Andreas Malm's How to Blow Up a Pipeline and the release of a fictionalized film adaptation of the same name last year, I think. Uh, it's it's a very good film. I, I highly recommend people watch it. Um, and moreover, some activist groups like Greenpeace have recently started to engage in small-scale acts of ecotage, like dropping heavy boulders into busy fishing grounds in order to damage trawlers' nets. Now, if this is a trend that's going to continue, as I think it surely will, as the time to solve the climate crisis grows ever shorter, then we should be thinking now about whether ecotage is justified so we're not caught sleeping when the first pipeline is blown up. So let's think about ecotage. How could engaging in targeted campaigns of property destruction possibly help the climate movement? Now, there are, I think, at least three robust mechanisms through which it could. First, if ecotage is aimed at destroying property that is itself involved in polluting activities like oil infrastructure or industrial farms, then destroying this property directly halts uh, this polluting activity and therefore has a positive climate impact. Second, there are ecotage's indirect effects on climate aggressors, namely those that contribute wrongfully to climate change. Ecotage creates an investment risk that makes it costly for polluters to engage in further polluting activities. Knowing that their polluting infrastructure is threatened by the prospect of destruction, climate aggressors may be less likely to invest in such infrastructure in future. Ender Gelander, a German environmentalist group, sums up this indirect mechanism in their slogan, we are the investment risk. Third and finally, ecotage may have the effect of framing non-violent climate groups as more moderate in comparison to the groups engaged in ecotage and thus pushing more of the population towards these non-violent groups. So in this way, violent direct action may be symbiotic with non-violent civil disobedience insofar as it makes the population more likely to be sympathetic to and engage with the non-violent groups which share similar aims. Moreover, I think if ecotage is well targeted at the agents most implicated in climate destruction, for example, if activists target oil infrastructure rather than tube trains, then people would see such action as fair in a way that they haven't uh, for some of the less well-targeted acts of civil disobedience that we've seen. Now, we might worry, of course, that ecotage could backfire. Destroying property in the name of the climate could make citizens and governments view the demands of the climate movement in an unfavorable light. The demands of the, of the climate movement as a whole may be tarnished by its association with violence. This, in turn, may stifle government's willingness to adopt environmentally beneficial policies and ultimately do more harm than good. Now, it's hard to say in the abstract whether ecotage could be effective. A lot will surely depend on the specific details of the proposed action. For now, though, I've briefly highlighted some of the main possible mechanisms through which it could be effective. I think it would be interesting to discuss this more in questions. For the rest of the talk, though, let's suppose that ecotage could be an effective activist tool. Importantly, this doesn't yet settle the moral question of whether we should undertake or encourage it. Just because ecotage would be... No, I I'm not... Sorry, it's not a seminar. It's just something I'm watching, but it happens to be live. What's that? Sorry. Ah, hello. Oh, OK, sorry. Well, I, there there will be some time for questions at the end, I hope. Uh, but I'm I've I've still got a a long way to go, so don't worry. Um, but good anyway. Uh, where where was I? Oh yes. Uh, so for so let's just say that ecotage uh, could be uh, an effective activist tool. So as I've said, this doesn't 
automatically settled the moral question of whether we should undertake it. So now the plan is to briefly outline some moral reasons against ecotage before presenting what I think is the strongest argument for it. This is the argument that ecotage can be justified as an act of self or other defense against climate injustice. So first, the objections or possible reasons against ecotage. Now, the first and most obvious one is that ecotage is risky. Blowing up a pipeline, for example, may, if not done carefully, severely harm innocent bystanders. Now, even though these effects may be merely foreseen and not intended, you might think that ecotage is posing a risk of harm to persons could tip the scales against its permissibility in certain cases. Now, in response to this, I, I see no, no reason in the abstract why, through careful planning and risk mitigation, by perhaps picking remote targets or warning those who could be in the area about a possible action, for example, I see no reason why instances of ecotage cannot be made permissibly risky. You know, in the circumstances, it may turn out that ecotage can be risky without being impermissibly reckless. Second, we might worry that if it comes to be widely performed, um, ecotage may have damaging secondary economic effects that fall disproportionately on the worst off. If blowing up a pipeline causes oil prices to rise, then the worst off groups globally will be made even worse off than they already are because they have to pay more for oil. Now, these costs to, to innocent bystanders may well tell against ecotage's overall permissibility. Now, in response to this worry, I'll only say, I'll only briefly note two counterpoints here. First, note that the policy decisions of governments in response to ecotage and the economic forces governing our particular economic system intervene in the causal chain between the act of blowing up a pipeline and the consequence of oil prices rising. This begs the question if the perpetrator of ecotage really can be held responsible for all of its secondary economic effects given all of these intervening causal factors. And if they can't be held responsible for some consequence, then how can this consequence make their action wrong? Now, even if we're not convinced by this responsibility argument, we might be convinced by a more naively consequentialist approach. Namely, perhaps a temporary harm to presently existing people can be outweighed by a far greater benefit to countless generations of future people. Now, so leaving aside these difficult questions of moral um, mathematics, we might still be troubled by the question of who should have their property destroyed. Who is a legitimate target of ecotage? People and companies have legal rights to their property, and it might seem morally wrong to infringe upon these rights, however noble your aim. Now, to address this concern about targeting, I think it will be useful now to lay out in some detail what I think the strongest moral argument in favor of ecotage is. The argument is summarized on your handouts. I'm going to read it out now before going through and expanding on, expanding on it step by step. Part of the attraction of this argument, I think, is that it tells us who is liable to having their property destroyed and thus addresses this targeting concern. So the argument goes like this. It's on page two uh, of the handout. Runaway climate change will severely harm many present and future people. Certain agents, let's call them climate aggressors, culpably and wrongly engage in activities that contribute enormously to climate change. For example, oil companies. Climate aggressors are culpably and wrongly harming many and future people, therefore. Now, an aggressor makes themselves liable to defensive harm when they culpably and wrongly harm someone else, namely their victim. And victims or agents acting on victims' behalf are in one way permitted to defensively harm aggressors, provided that this defensive harm is effective and proportionate. Therefore, climate aggressors are liable to defensive harm, and victims or agents acting on their behalf are in one way permitted to defensively harm them. And then, given that ecotage or sabotage of a climate aggressor's property is a harm that can be both proportionate and effective at halting or slowing a climate aggressor's climate change causing activities, then ecotage as an instance of effective and proportionate other defense is pro tanto justified. 
So this is the argument expressed in sort of premise, premise, conclusion form. I'm now going to go through it step by step, hopefully show it to be sound uh, and highlight some points for further discussion. So let's start with premise one. Runaway climate change will severely harm many present and future people. Now, although there are still important philosophical problems to be solved in accounting for the truth of this claim, I don't think it uh, I don't think much really needs to be said about it here. If climate change weren't harmful, why bother doing anything to stop it? Premise two requires a bit more unpacking. Premise two tells us that certain agents culpably and wrongly engage in activities that contribute enormously to climate change. Now, note to start with that with this claim, I have in mind primarily certain collective agents like large oil companies or large logging companies or industrial farmers, rather than individual agents like you or me. Now, this isn't to get us individuals off the hook, but it's just because these collective climate aggressors contribute far more to climate change than any particular individual does. Therefore, if anything follows morally from contributing to climate change, then we'll be able to see this most obviously by focusing on these collective agents who contribute the most. So the first thing that needs to be done here is to justify the claim that these climate aggressors oil companies, meat processing firms, etc., are in fact agents capable of acting culpably and wrongly at all. Now, first note in defense of this, that we treat them as if they are agents, both in law and in conversation, and don't find it odd to do so. We freely say things like Shell did this, or BP has been found guilty of that. Now, on some accounts of morally responsible agency, being embedded in responsibility conferring practices like this is sufficient for, quali for qualifying as a morally responsible agent. But even if we don't accept these views, I think our practices here should be taken as a useful guide to the reality. These collective, en these collective entities have deliberative and causal capacities that are independent from those of the individuals that make them up. When a board of directors makes a decision, for example, this decision is, uh, is attributable to the board, taken as a unified and emergent whole, rather than just to the conjunction of the individuals that comprise it. Now, even on quite demanding views about the conditions for responsible agency, I think, certain collective entities will qualify as at least minimally responsible agents. We should, in other words, take our responsibility practices at face value. When we talk as though these entities are agents, we make no mistake. Now, accepting this, it still needs to be shown that these agents are culpable for their climate change causing activities and that these activities are wrong. Now, to justify the claim that they're wrong, I don't think we need to assume any particular account of wrongness. Instead, I think these activities have a multitude of features that, either individually or together, are wrong-making on most plausible accounts of wrongness. For example, many climate aggressors have known for a long time that their activities are both extremely harmful and avoidable. Oil companies, for example, have known that their activities contribute to climate change and about its harmful effects for many years. They clearly act in full knowledge of the harmful effects of their activities. Surely this is a wrong-making feature if there ever was one. Further, that these activities contribute enormously to climate change and thus, by premise one, are profoundly harmful is also clear. It's a well-worn fact that just 100 companies have emitted 71% of all the greenhouse gas emissions since 1998. Now, of course, we could debate the intricacies of carbon accounting until the cows come home. Namely, the problem of how we can attribute these emissions to these companies if these companies act on behalf of individuals who ultimately benefit from their carbon-intensive activities. Now, there are different ways of carbon accounting, um, but... I think that one strong reason to, to attribute emissions to these climate aggressors rather than to downstream consumers of their products follows from the fact that these activities have, for a long time, been avoidable for these collective agents in a way that they have not been for downstream consumers. Oil companies, for example, have been aware that feasible green alternatives to their products exist for some time and have yet actively stifled their adoption. Just think of the billions they spend every year lobbying against green policies. Now, as these collective agents have the economic power to trigger a transition away from carbon-intensive activities, 
in a way that no individual consumer does, then it makes some sense to attribute emissions to them rather than to the downstream consumers. They acquire the carbon debt willingly by refusing to act on the alternatives. So that these climate aggressors know that their activities are extremely harmful and avoidable is surely enough to render them wrong on most plausible accounts of wrongness. Further, the knowledge condition here is, I think, sufficient to generate culpability. Knowingly causing some harm is enough to make one culpable, if not fully responsible, with respect to that harm. So, premise two, then. Premise two is the claim that agents... Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. So, premise two is the claim that agents culpably and wrongly engage in activities that contribute enormously to climate change. I think this premise is surely true. Now, bringing this together with the first claim, then we get the claim that climate aggressors are culpably and wrongly harming many present and future people. So from here, the next step of the argument makes the claim that aggressors make themselves liable to a certain kind of defensive harm when they culpably and wrongly harm others. Now, by liable, I mean that an aggressor is liable to some defensive harm just when they wouldn't be wronged if someone were to inflict the harm on them. So to illustrate the idea, consider the case of Bob the attacker. You're walking along the street and someone, Bob, jumps out and attacks you. Unless Bob is stopped, he's certain to break your arm. His attack is entirely unjustified and he's fully culpable with respect to his action. The only way for you to neutralize Bob's attack and avoid having your arm broken is to break his little finger. You decide to do so, and in doing so, cause him considerable harm, albeit less than he would have caused you. Now, I think our judgment in this case is that you don't do anything wrong. Your breaking Bob's finger is entirely morally permissible. Now, this is so partly because by harming Bob in this way, you don't wrong Bob. Like You don't violate any claim that Bob has in this situation not to be harmed in this way. In in other words, you don't wrong Bob by breaking his finger because he has, through his actions, made himself liable to your defensive harm. Now, all of the above is true, even though Bob usually has some strong claim, perhaps even a right, against being harmed. Now, even though Bob usually has a right against being harmed, Bob waives this right against harm by acting wrongly in this case, by attacking you. So by attacking you, Bob waives his right against harm and makes himself liable to defensive harm inflicted by you. Now, we can see now that climate aggressors are very much like Bob. They act wrongly by contributing to climate change, and so they make themselves liable to defensive harm by climate victims. Climate victims are morally allowed to harm the climate aggressor, just as you are morally allowed to harm Bob. Now, before moving on, I should I should elucidate premise three's crucial reference to proportionality and efficacy. As we'll see, these conditions play a really important dual role in my argument. So let's consider each in turn. So to motivate the, pro the proportionality condition, consider again the case of Bob. If instead of breaking Bob's finger, the only way to neutralize his attack would have been to kill him, then there would have been no way for you permissibly to avoid his attack. To kill Bob in order to prevent him from injuring your arm would be to wrong Bob, or in other words, to inflict a harm upon him for which he's not liable. Bob's attacking you makes him liable to some harm, but not to all harm, and certainly not to a harm as severe as death. This result is plausibly explained by there being some proportionality constraint on the aggressor's liability to defensive harm. The amount of harm that an aggressor makes themselves liable to by culpably and wrongly harming some victim is in some way proportionate to the magnitude of their wrongful harm. Now, I won't go into too much detail here, but plausibly the proportionality condition would hold that the defensive harm to which an aggressor is liable may be more severe than the original wrongful harm, but not too much more. So, for example, if the only way that you could prevent me from wrongly flicking you on the cheek is by killing me, then this harm would be disproportionate, and that's a harm to which I am not liable. But if you could stop me flicking you by flicking me twice, or perhaps by flicking me twice as hard as I was going to flick you, 
then maybe this is proportionate. Now, the details, although important, aren't important here. Or um, all that matters is that there's clearly some proportionality constraint on the magnitude of the, of the defensive harm that aggressors make themselves liable to. Next, let us consider the efficacy condition. Now, very often in the literature on self-defense, it's assumed that some form of necessity condition applies to defensive harm, namely that aggressors are liable only to defensive harms that are the least harmful necessary means for avoiding or neutralizing their wrongful harm. Um, like if, uh, if you could prevent an aggressor from harming you by some less harmful means, then you're morally committed to taking that less, like the least harmful means possible to avoiding their uh, wrongful attack. Now, I think that this form formulation of the necessity condition is, is too strong and that we should go with a weaker condition called the efficacy condition for at least two reasons. Now, to see these reasons, consider the following case. Suppose that I attack you and you could prevent this attack in one of two ways. One is that you could strike me very hard, causing me considerable harm. This course of action is almost certain to succeed, and you know it to be. The second way is that you could use the feather in your pocket to tickle my cheek. Given that I'm very ticklish, this response would neutralize my attack whilst causing me far less harm. Now, even though this response is epistemically far more difficult for you to access, how on earth could you come to know that I'm ticklish? and less likely to succeed, what if you tickle the wrong part of my cheek, the minimal harm condition on defensive harm commits us to saying that only this latter option is permissible, that I'm only allowed, that you're only allowed to tickle my cheek rather than to strike me hard. Clearly, I think this is wrong. At the very least, both options are permissible, assuming that the proportionality condition holds. This is because the former option, although not minimally harmful, is the only one that's both epistemically available to the to the victim and likely to succeed. It's the only one that the victim could possibly know that is likely to succeed. The, effic the efficacy condition, as I understand it, can accommodate this result. Some defensive harm is permissible only if it's effective, where being effective need not mean minimally harmful for the reasons just discussed. Now, why is this point of detail important for ecotage? Now, this point of detail is important for ecotage, I think, in the following way. It might, in fact, be possible to prevent climate change, uh, of, of, to prevent climate aggressors from doing their wrongful, wrongful acts through an extended campaign of peaceful protest and the, and the ensuing gradual policy change, i.e. with minimal harm to the aggressors. Now, this route, although less harmful to the aggressors may have a lower probability of succeeding and be less epistemically accessible to us than more direct and harmful actions like e ecotage. The efficacy condition leaves open the permissibility of ecotage, whereas the necessity condition does not. So to wrap up this part of the argument, because an aggressor makes themselves liable to defensive harm by wrongfully harming some victim, then victims or people acting on the victim's behalf are in one way permitted to defensively harm them. As we've said, this is provided that the defensive harm is effective and proportionate. We should, I think, accept premise three and premise four. So bringing this all, all together and applying it to the climate case, then we get the case, uh, we get the claim that climate aggressors are liable to defensive harm and climate victims or agents acting on their behalf are pro tanto permitted to effectively and proportionately, defensively harm them. Now, it all gets a little bit quicker from here. Premise five is the claim that sabotage of a climate aggressor's property, or ecotage, is a harm that can be both proportionate and effective at halting or slowing a climate aggressor's wrongful activities. Now, this claim assumes that destroying an agent's property is a form of harm. When performed for environmental purposes, this harm is ecotage. Now, that seems like the right way to think about what property destruction is, in, in my view. Destroying someone's property is a form of harm. Now, depending on its scale in a given case, ecotage can surely be a harm that's both proportionate and effective at, at slowing an aggressor's wrongful harms. That it can be proportionate is surely beyond doubt. 
What is the blowing up of a pipeline when the well-being of countless future generations is at stake? The efficacy of ecotage is more controversial and something that I touched upon earlier. But remember, if ecotage can be effective, then I think the conclusion follows from everything we've said so far. Ecotage, as an instance of effective and proportionate other defense, is in at least one way justified. So this then is the argument that I think is most convincing for morally justifying ecotage. If we see the harms involved in ecotage as defensive harms against acts of climate aggression, then we can use the logic of self and other defense as a moral justification for these acts. And we can also see who is liable to having their property destroyed, namely those, those agents who wrongfully engage in really, client, in really destructive activities. Now, before moving on to some questions, I'd like to offer a final thought about how I've encouraged us to think about things here. I framed our discussion of ecotage and the climate crisis in combative terms, in terms of aggressors, victims, defense, and attack. This, I think, is a valuable way of thinking about the climate crisis. Climate change isn't just an accidental process with respect to which we are all innocent passengers. It's a problem that is in large part engineered wrongfully by those who profit from the harms it brings. Perhaps by seeing the crisis in these terms as a struggle between perpetrators and victims, we can more clearly come to see the morality of the situation at hand. Namely that certain actions, which may be impermissible in a context of justice, become, mo become morally sanctionable in the unjust world in which we live. So anyway, that's, that's the argument uh, briefly summarized. Um, I think I've uh, stayed well within the time, but we do have uh, some time for questions.